Good evening, everyone. I think we'll uh, get started. Today we have the Honourable Rosalind Atkinson, uh, a M O O, uh, speaking today on juries, their place in democracy, achievements and challenges. It's a hundred years since women were allowed to serve on juries in Queensland, and this was the first state in Australia to introduce what, what was then a radical reform. So what are the challenges today for the composition of juries to reflect the judgment of a defendant's peers and reflect modern democratic values? Well, we're going to learn all about that. And if I know um, Rosalind Atkinson, as I do, we'll hear a little more. I'd like to introduce uh, the Honourable uh, Rosalind Atkinson. Uh, she was a judge of the Supreme Court of Queensland for just over 20 years, from 1998 to 2018. During this time, she conducted many high-profile civil and criminal trials. She was lead author of the Supreme Court of Queensland's Equal Treatment Bench Book, the first in Australia. She was the chair of the Queensland Law Reform Commission from 2002 to 2013, during which time she was responsible for a number of reports about the criminal justice system, including a report on jury directions in 2009 and on jury selection in 2011. Both of these reports led to significant changes to the law and procedure involving juries. I note that um, Rosalind was a trial judge in many, many jury trials before the Supreme Court of Queensland, including in 2014, the trial of Daniel Morecambe's murderer, Brett Peter Cowan. In 2015, Rosalind was appointed an Officer of the Order of Australia for Distinguished Service for the Judiciary and to law reform in Queensland th uh, through contributions to the legal profession and to promoting awareness of issues of injustice and inequality in Australia and internationally. And I should say that Rosalind finished being a Supreme Court judge in 2018 and that I was appointed to, as the judge to replace Rosalind, and I now sit in her old room, a fact which she makes clear to me she would like back. <laughs> After her retirement from the judiciary in November 2018, she's undertaken a number of leadership and legal roles in the wider community. She's uh, been working on commissions and inquiries and is uh, also a part of Screen Queensland. I'd like you all today to introduce the Honourable Rosalind Atkinson, AO. Uh, thank you, Justice Wilson, for that lovely introduction, and thank you very much for looking after my room so well. Um, and thank you, friends and colleagues, all for attending tonight. May I acknowledge that we meet on the land of the Turrbal and Jagera nations and thank them for their generosity in sharing their beautiful and abundant country with us. I pay my respects to their elders past and present and to all First Nations people here tonight. Tonight, we should start with a celebration. It is, as Justice Wilson said, a hundred years since Queensland became the first state in Australia to allow women to serve on juries. It was a heady time for law reform in Queensland. In March 1922, the Upper House was abolished. Then the death penalty was abolished by amendments to the Criminal Code. In the next year, the grounds for divorce for both men and women were widened so that women were able to be granted a divorce on the same grounds as men. And a Jury Act Amendment Act was introduced in 1923, effective from 1924, which made Queensland the first state in Australia to give women the right to serve on a jury. However, if a woman wished to take advantage of that newfound right, she had to provide notification of her desire to do so. This has been referred to as the opt-in system. The Amendment Act was revolutionary in other ways in that it widened the right and duty of all men on the electoral roll subject to age and occupational exemptions to be eligible for jury service. 
The history of eligibility to serve on a jury in Australia in colonial times was informed by a frontier mentality, as were many aspects of life in the land that was to become Australia. The New South Wales Act of UK in 19, 1823 was the founding legislation that provided for the creation of the Supreme Court of New South Wales and jury trials in the colony. At this time, jurors were only qualified if they were commissioned officers or men who possessed freehold estates. Only men born from a British or Irish mother were capable of owning such estates. So women were excluded by law, as were First Nations people. Section four of the Jury Trials Act 1832 provided for the disqualification of every man not being a natural born subject of the king and every man who hath been or shall be attainted of any treason or felony or convicted of any crime that is infamous unless he shall have received such crime a pardon or the full period shall have expired for which he shall have been sentenced to be transported and every man of bad faith or of dishonest life or conduct or of immoral character or repute. Indeed, section five further provide that people who've been twice convicted of any treason, felony or infamous offence would also be disqualified. There was no need to mention the disqualification of women as they were not qualified in the first place. With minor amendments, this was the law that applied in the new colony of Queensland in 1859. Section three of the Jury Act of 1867 in Queensland disqualified all men from serving on any jury in any court or in any occasion whatsoever who were not a natural born or naturalized subject of the Queen and who shall not be able to read and write and who shall have been convicted of any treason or felony or of any crime that is infamous unless he shall obtain a free pardon thereof or who is insolvent or bankrupt. This is essentially where legislation rested until the 1924 Amendment Act. Section two of the 1924 Act repealed section one of the Jury Act of 1867 and inserted a new section one which provided, subsection one, all male persons between the ages of 21 and 60 years who are enrolled on the respective annual electoral rolls for the time being as electors under the law relating to the election of members of the Legislative Assembly, and two, all female persons between the ages of 21 and 60 years who were so enrolled and who notify in writing addressed to the principal electoral officer that they desire to serve as jurors shall, shall subject to certain exceptions set forth in the Act, shall be qualified and liable to serve on all juries that may be impanelled of any trial or inquiry within the jury district within which such electors are shown by the said respective annual elective roles to reside. The reform, while revolutionary in Australia, was still redolent of stereotypical attitudes to women. For example, subsection six of section three provided that any person who showed good reason could be excused. However, a female person did not have to show good reason. It provided that the sheriff could excuse from attendance as a juror every female person who applied to be exempted from service on a jury by reason of the nature of the evidence to be given or the issues to be tried. Even so, the reform was not universally welcomed. The Argus newspaper reported on the amendment bill declaring the amendments to be drastic changes. When first introduced into parliament, one member wondered whether women would be called juresses. An opposition member worried about what might happen if they were locked up overnight. Laughter ensued at the idea that women jurors might be locked up with male jurors. And Mr King said that if the jury was locked up all night and there were women on the jury, then he was perfectly certain that their minds would not be on the case. Mr Cooper asked what he thought their minds would be on. 
When the hilarity ceased, Mr King said that all joking aside, he did not think that having women on the jury would lead to a just verdict. When the Attorney General said that it was what women wanted, Mr King said, they are always after something new. The Attorney General assured the House that women could be excused for medical reasons or because of the nature of the evidence or the issue to be tried. In his second reading speech, the Attorney General gave a rousing speech comparing the innovation of allowing women to serve on juries to providing suffrage for women and referred to the many common law jurisdictions where this reform had already taken place and repeated that women wanted the reform. Mr Valls, MLA, however, was not convinced. There are women, he said, that are so mannish in their ideas that they want to do anything men do. Some even think that they should come into the House of Parliament. He thought that few women would sacrifice their home duties to, quote, mess about with a jury. Mr King said it was a remarkable innovation with which he did not agree, pointing out that there were no sanitary conveniences for women in courthouses in Brisbane or indeed in Queensland, which could cater for women if they would serve on juries. The next bill debated, on the other hand, was notable for the seriousness of its tone and the earnestness of the debate. That bill was the Stallion Registration Bill. The jury amendment bill passed the third reading on the 2nd of October 23 and received royal assent along with the aforementioned Stallion Registration Act on the 11th of October 1923. When debating a similar proposed change in Western Australia, the redoubtable Mr Griffiths, member for Avon, opined that only a few women in search of notoriety and limelight would apply for enrolment. Yet another member said it would only attract sticky beaks. And Mr Marshall commented, if the clause stands and the right to exercise the privilege is voluntary, only one section of the women will be affected. That section will be those who are always desirous of pushing a certain part of their bodies into other people's business. And these are the very people we do not desire to see on a jury. As late as 1955, another member argued that the women who avail themselves of this provision would be what some people regard as battle axes. So, returning to Queensland, what was the social milieu in which this jury reform occurred? The end of the First World War led to a huge social upheaval. In Australia, out of a population in 1914 of just under five million people, almost half a million men enlisted. More than 60,000 were killed and 156,000 wounded, gassed or taken prisoner. This led to many changes for women. Many lost the opportunity to follow the usual expected course for women of their generation, marry, have children and leave or never take part in the paid workforce in the face of family responsibilities. In fact, I was taught by women like that. No doubt some of them found this change to be a liberating experience. Queensland had already been progressive for women in different ways. In 1905, women in Queensland had been granted the right to vote in state elections, although they didn't have the opportunity to vote until 1907. They'd won the right to be elected to the Queensland Parliament under amendments in 1915, although the first woman ML MLA, Irene Longman, was not elected until 1929. However, the reform envisaged by the Juries Act stalled. Not only did it fail to make a practical difference, as we will see, but it was not taken up by other states or even the progressive New Zealand. However, there were a few progressive lawyers in Australia who publicly argued for reform of the law so that women could and should serve on juries, often addressing the common myths about women. For example, Philip Ackland Jacobs, a prominent Melbourne trial barrister, wrote an article in the ALJ in 1933 articulating the reasons for removing the disqualification of women from jury service. He argued from two points of view. 
Firstly, the effect which the presence of women on juries would have on the administration of justice. And secondly, the effect it would have on women themselves in adding to their activities and affecting their status. He noted that the view that women should be eligible for jury service appeared to be generally held in England and the USA as it was, with no ill consequences. He expressed the opinion that opposition was due at least in part to a certain measure of sex bias or sex antagonism. To quote, he said, men often talk disparagingly of women and regard them with a certain amount of hostility. It is impossible to review the women's movement during, let's say, the last 50 years and to reflect upon the enormous progress that women have made during that period in almost every sphere of life without realising that they would have been where they are today long ago, but for the assumption made by the generality of men that the other sex was inferior. Even, he observed, such highly trained critics as judges and lawyers are apt to be too conservative in their outlook with regard to such a question as the one under consideration, while they too are sometimes affected by the bias already referred to. He listed the objections made to him about women being on juries, which supported his thesis about bias by men against women. Women are too illogical. They are too prone to, drop to con jump to conclusions. They take extreme views against people who are intemperate. His arguments in favour of women as jurors, which worked to the advantage of the jury, were the advantage of a jury is that it consists of a number of persons with different occupations and experience, mentality and outlook. Although parts of their lives are similar, in some spheres women are more familiar than men with certain aspects of life. And in regard to those matters, women as jurors would make a distinct contribution to the elucidation of the problems to be solved in the jury room. He also argued that since women are both parties and witnesses in civil and criminal trials, it was more likely that another woman was more likely to understand her evidence and determine her truthfulness because she was more likely to understand her point of view and therefore help to secure a just determination of the issues. He referred then to the reasons relating to the rights of women. Women take an active part in commercial and professional life. They have equal rights with men as voters and legislators. They act as magistrates, hold property, may sue and be sued, and often provide a home and maintain the family. He therefore concluded that not only did it seem illogical to deprive women of the right and duty and function to function as jurors, but it was clear that the pursuit of various capacities which the law did allow them to pursue gave them that sort of knowledge and aptitude which fitted them for jury service. He asked rhetorically, why should the discharge of the very serious duty of determining the grave question of whether a fellow citizen, male or female, is or is not to be deprived of his or her liberty and bland branded with disgrace be left to one half of the adult population to the exclusion of the other. He asked, what if the position today were reverse? Suppose that all jurors were of the female sex. He supposed that women would not be likely to allege that men are too stubborn, too stupid, or too immoral to serve on juries. Unfortunately, his enlightened argument fell on deaf ears. Remember, no woman had yet served on a jury in Australia at that time. So did enabling women to serve on juries, rather than requiring them to do so, have any practical effect? In 1936, Mr Justice Evatt, as he was, then was, gave an address on the jury system in Australia to the Australian Legal Convention. In a long, deeply researched speech, which included an examination of jury law and practice in each state, he observed that only Queensland had undertaken the reform of allowing women to apply to serve on a jury. Everett told the assembling his research had showed that only 52 applications for enrolment had been made in Queensland, and of those, only 36 were eligible, 
and although at rare intervals they had been summoned to the jury service, by 1936, 12 years after the reform was legislated, none had ever been impanelled to serve on a jury. He observed that even after opting in, women faced being excluded by lawyers acting for the parties in civil matters or the prosecution or defence in criminal matters. Evert argued it was difficult under a democratic system to justify either disqualification or immunity on the ground of either sex or property interests. In Queensland, during the Second World War, an Emergency Act was passed in 1942. It reduced the required number on a jury in a criminal case from 12 to 7 and extended the age for men to serve on a jury from 60 to 65. But no change was made to the rights or obligations of women to serve on juries. It was not until 1945, towards the end of the Second World War, that a woman was finally impanelled to serve on a jury in Australia. The Courier Mail reported that on the 1st of March 1945, Queensland's first female juror was impanelled at Brisbane's Supreme Court. Nellie Bishop, described as a housewife from Kelvin Grove, who had never before been inside a courtroom, was thrust into the media spotlight. I was scared stiff, she told a reporter from the Courier Mail. She told the Truth newspaper about the impanelling process. When I came to court, I thought I would be among other women, not one woman amongst 47 men. When they called the names of the jurors, they called Mr Bishop, and I did not answer. But when the sheriff said, jury men, please answer your names, I thought I'd better answer. The court case for which Nellie was a juror involved a taxi driver accused of stealing bedsheets from the American Red Cross. After several days, although the case was still running, Nellie was discharged from jury service. No reason was proffered for her discharge. Around the same time, the National Council of Women complained to the Attorney General about the inequality of uh, rates of pay between male and female jurors. Uh, at, any time, at the time, any woman who was impanelled to serve on a jury was paid nine shillings and tuppence per day, while men received 16 shillings and tuppence per day. The council argued that as both male and female jurists were performing the same role, women's fight for equality and entitlement still had much further to run. With regard to jury service, that would appear to be quite an understatement. In August 1947, the Australian Law Journal noted in its current topics that the New South Wales government had announced its intention to amend the Jury Act to allow women to serve on juries. It is perhaps worthy of note that this move followed yet another world war where women were needed and had been required to take up the jobs, usually the reserve of men. The ALJ noted the approval of women's organisations who regarded it as a step forward towards equality. However, counsel with extensive experience with jurors was said to be apprehensive, doubting its wisdom and foreseeing additional problems with advocacy. However, the good editors of the ALJ had a more sanguine view. It is at least logical, they said, that once women were entitled to vote for the election of the country's lawmakers, and to appear in court as parties, witnesses, or even counsel, and are generally entitled and subject to the privileges and responsibilities of citizenship, including the privilege of contributing to consolidate revenue, that they should take part, as ordinary citizens are called upon to do in the actual administration of justice. The author noted that between 1936, when Evert spoke, in 1947, only three women had actually served on juries in Queensland. Meanwhile, the experience in New Zealand, often the vanguard of rights for women, is also salutary here. Women were enabled to serve on juries by the Women Jurors Act of 1942. The Chief Justice, Sir Michael Myers, referred to the topic in his valedictory speech in 1946. By 1943, he said, 
17 women had joined the role, with none being added in 1944, one in 1945, and two in 1946. The number of women drawn to be on a panel was one, and none had served. The Chief Justice said, to his knowledge, there was only one case in the whole of New Zealand where a woman had actually served on a jury. This is yet another example of the failure of the opt-in system. It is interesting to note that the reform, the reform was not framed in terms of the rights of the accused person to have a representative jury, as was the case in the USA, where women commonly served on juries. Back in Queensland, the Jury Act Amendment Act of 1964 made modest changes to the criteria for women to be eligible to serve on a jury, but continued the largely ineffective opt-in system. Section 6 now provides that every male person between the ages of 21 and 65 on the electoral roll was required to serve on a jury, whereas for female persons the age range was 21 to 60 years of age. And once again, it was only an opt-in system, with the following proviso. Provide that nothing in the foregoing provisions shall affect the right of any person to be excused from attendance as a juror on the ground of illness, or, if a woman, for medical reasons. I've not been able to find any explanation as to why women could only be eligible to the age of 60, while men remained able to serve on a jury to the age of 65. So following the opt-in system, which had proved so unsuccessful, there followed the opt-out version. In 1975, the opt-out system was introduced in Queensland. Section 6 of the Jury Act now provided that the jury list would consist of all persons entitled to vote as an elector at the election of a member of the Legislative Assembly. However, Section 24A7, subsection 3, provided that where a female person received a notice to attend, she was to be notified that she could seek exemption from serving on, on any jury without assigning any reason, therefore. Section 26A provided the creation of a female juror suspense list. A notable case in Queensland occurred in the early 1990s, when a judge of the district court allowed a male defendant to challenge for cause all prospective women jurors on the basis that it was against his beliefs to be tried by women, which was, in his view, an abomination of God. The offence charge was demanding with menaces and didn't appear to raise any sexual or gender-based issues. In uh, The Queen Against a Judge of the District Court in Shelley in 1991, the full court of the Supreme Court of Queensland held that the trial was null and void. The simple fact of being a woman was held not to be a ground for challenge for cause, which otherwise must be proved. The court held that from the time the defendant was first allowed to challenge a female member of the jury panel on the basis of her sex alone, the trial was not authorised by law and the jury was not lawfully constituted and the proceedings after the plea were a nullity. This might appear to be progress, but it was not until 1997 that women had the same right and responsibility to serve on juries in Queensland as men. In 1993, the Litigation Reform Commission recommended that a new Jury Act be enacted in Queensland. The result was the introduction into Parliament of the Jury Bill 1995. The bill had been intended to drastically cut the range of people who were exempt from jury service and to ensure their juries were more representative of the community. The jury vetting would become a thing of the past, therefore protecting the privacy of potential jurors and the confidentiality of jury deliberations were secured. However, not all the recommendations for the removal of exemptions survived, but it did remove the opt-out system for women so that they could no longer seek automatic exemption on the basis of the sex, their sex. The Jury Act 1995 giving effect to that recommendation was assented to on the 9th of November 1995 
but did not commence until the 17th of February 1997. <clears throat> I became a judge in September 1998, only a year after I could have claimed exemption from serving on a jury simply because of my gender. So I was able to look back and examine the practical effect of this change. My first criminal jury trial was in October 1998. The judge's associate notes the names of jurors as they're impanelled, so I've been able to examine the gender composition of the jury. There is no reason to suspect that these, these observations are not typical since it is not the judge who chooses the jury. In the first trial I conducted, the first five jurors impanelled were women. By the end of the impanelment, seven were women and five were men. The next trial, my first murder trial, was an incredibly difficult trial where the deceased, a merchant seaman, the partner of the defendant, had simply disappeared from the face of the earth. It was not until the accused was convicted of the attempted murder of her next de facto partner that the police, led by the first woman with sufficient seniority in the homicide squad, took up the case and through thorough and painstaking investigation presented a convincing circumstantial case to the jury. And pod impanelment, seven of the jury's jurors were women and five men. The defendant was convicted. My next murder trial saw eight men impanelled and four women. A drugs pile followed with eight women impanelled and four men. Notably, although the accused was of Asian origin, no Asian names appear in the names of the jurors impanelled. After that, the numbers appear fairly even. I've never had a jury of all men, or indeed all women. Although the jury in my first trial in a country town had only three women, the next had six of each sex, so the preponderance of men in the first jury can just be considered random. In 2009, the Queensland Law Reform Commission obtained some demographic graphic information as part of the research carried out by the University of Queensland for the Commission's review of jury directions. That research involved surveys and interviews with people who'd served as jurors on criminal trials held in the Supreme Court and District Court of Queensland in Brisbane in mid-2009. The following demographics were revealed. It revealed effectively equal numbers of men and women served on jury and responded to the questionnaire. However, none identified, self-identified as Indigenous. The empirical evidence in other states, specifically in New South Wales, Tasmania and Victoria, supports the view that gender equality in jury selection has been reached and has become unremarkable. So, during my judicial career, gender parity on juries had been reached. What is perhaps remarkable is how entirely unremarkable it is. No one pushes back. No one suggests that it led to any unfairness in the conduct or outcome of criminal trials. So let me move on to a slightly different topic. There is still reason to argue that juries remain unrepresentative of all parts of our community. I noted, for example, when I heard the trial of an Aboriginal man accused of murdering his partner at Aracoon, that the jury panel in Cairns did not include even one First Nations person, even though a knowledge of the culture, relationships and methods of communicating in that community were essential to understanding the background to the events that occurred and the way in which the witnesses gave their evidence. I think this raises two fundamental principles in relation to the composition of juries in our justice system, which should always be at the forefront of discussions on this topic. The innovation of allowing and then requiring women to serve on juries raise these two related but also independent and equally important questions. The first was the role of women's role in the criminal justice system, and the second was the role of juries as representatives of the community. 
The former considers the rights and responsibilities of women as citizens, and the latter concerns the rights of a criminal defendant to a fair trial of his or her peers. These principles apply equally to all marginalised groups in our society. Our review of jury uh, selection done by the Queensland Law Reform Commission referred to by Justice Wilson was guided by the principle that in order to enhance the representative nature of juries, the pool from which prospective jurors are drawn should be as large as circumstances and principle permit. After all, this dates back to at least the Magna Carta and its famous clauses 39 and 40. No free man shall be arrested or imprisoned except by the lawful judgment of his peers, by the law of the land. While Magna Carta is no longer a law in Queensland, the right of defendants to the lawful judgment of their peers has remained a bedrock principle of our criminal justice system. This was expressed by the plurality of the High Court in Doney and the Queen. The genius of the jury system is that it allows for the ordinary experiences of ordinary people to be brought to bear in the determination of factual matters. It is fundamental to that purpose that the jury be allowed to determine by inference from its collective experience of ordinary affairs, whether, and in the case of conflict, what evidence is truthful. These observations are only true for all people who are affected by the criminal justice system if no group sees their members subject to explicit or implicit bias, which prevents them from being chosen for jury service. This is particularly so for First Nations people whom we know are overrepresented in the criminal justice system. While there may be no direct discrimination against First Nations people in the Jury Act, a number of factors combine to make their presence less, less likely. So let us take a brief look of, at the history that uh, informs this. Calls for Aboriginal representation on juries have been made since at least the 19th century. Uh, for example, in 1830, a publication by the Attorney General of New South Wales called for administrators of British law to organise juries of half natives and half colonists for cases affecting natives, to use his language. An early example of Aboriginal people requesting a trial by an Aboriginal jury in New South Wales was in 1836, when two Aboriginal men were accused of murdering two other Aboriginal men. They requested an all-Aboriginal jury, but were denied it. An 1840 report endorsed by a committee of the Aborigines Protection Society for circulation among members of parliament called for a mixed jury of colonists and Aboriginal members. In, 18, in 1944, anthropologist A.P. Elkind argued that the use of a white jury in cases with Aboriginal and European parties could contain potent seeds of bias and injustice. He suggested there either should be no jury or that the jury consist of half white and half Aboriginal members. At the time the Jury Act in New South Wales was passed in 1977, the lack of Aboriginal representation on juries was well known to Parliament. During the second reading speech, the Honourable L.A. Solomons said of the 300 to 400 people of Aboriginal extraction in the Tamworth area, only one person could genuinely claim, who could genuinely claim to have Aboriginal blood, was on the jury roll. More recent case law has also considered the underrepresentation of Aboriginal people on juries. In The Queen Against Smith in 1981, Three Aboriginal members of the jury panel were subject to peremptory challenge by the Crown prosecutor and did not serve on the jury. The trial judge dismissed the jury and required the trial to take place on another day. The judge found that the lack of Aboriginal people on the jury could suggest that justice was not being done and was detrimental to community perceptions of justice. In 1986, 
the New South Wales Law Reform Commission considered the Jury Act and endorsed the idea that all Australians should have an equal chance to serve as jurors. In 2007, the Commission again considered the issue of jury participation and found that Aboriginal people were disproportionately precluded from jury duty. For example, those who were unable to speak or read standard English, which, who were disqualified under the Act, and those with chronic health problems, including hearing loss, again, might be lawfully disqualified from jury service. In Queensland, in 1989, an Aboriginal defendant submitted that a jury of his peers required a jury of people drawn from his people of the New Knuckle Nation, or clan. In The Queen Against Walker, in 1989, Justice McPherson observed of a jury of which none of the members were Aboriginal, let alone a New Knuckle person, as the defendant was, he said, Whatever else may be said about those who comprise the jury at the trial of the applicant in this case, there were at law, certainly, all his equals, as he was theirs. That may be how a judge would see it, but what of a defendant who sees no one who looks like him on the jury panel? In The Queen Against Badenoch, uh, the Victorian Court of Appeal uh, considered a case in which an Indigenous defendant unsuccessfully objected to the composition of the panel as he'd not observed anyone he identified as an Indigenous person, despite being in a location with a high Indigenous population. Uh, the Queensland Law Reform Commission argued in its 2011 report on jury selection that it is critical that steps be taken to increase Indigenous participation in the jury system. This is important not only to increase the representativeness of juries, but also to reduce the sense of exclusion from the criminal justice system that is experienced by so many Indigenous people. Some of the Commission's recommendations were aimed at removing the inherent or implicit bias against First Nations people and should contribute to an increased representation of Indigenous people on juries. In addition, the Commission made a number of non-legislative recommendations to address the practical barriers which often apply to Indigenous participation. It recommended that the Department of Justice and the Attorney General should, as a priority, review the current jury districts with a view to increasing the representativeness of juries and including additional Indigenous communities, which are often outside a jury district. If public or private transport was not reasonably available or cannot reasonably be used, the sheriff should, if necessary, make arrangements in advance to assist people from Indigenous communities to attend court when summonsed for jury service and should meet the costs of those arrangements. If it's not reasonably practical for a person from an Indigenous community to travel every day to attend court for jury service, accommodation should be arranged and funded to enable the person to attend. Culturally appropriate educational programs that promote the importance and benefits of jury service should be developed and made available within Indigenous communities. And research should be conducted to determine the extent of representation of Indigenous people on juries in Queensland and the factors that may increase or reduce their participation in jury service. The underrepresentation of First Nations people on juries remains a continuing problem, just as the underrepresentation of women was. In his foreword to uh, an AIJA report, Towards Truth, the Australian Jury in Black and White, which was completed in June 2023, Tony McAvoy, a senior counsel, encapsulated both the reality and the perception of injustice that it gave rise to when he wrote. And this is his preface to that report, which I think is very powerful. From December 2021 to the end of March 2022, I was resident in Darwin, coming to terms with my role as Acting Treaty Commissioner for the Northern Territory. At the same time, 
the trial of R. V. Rolfe was in full swing. Senior Constable Blackery Rolfe had been charged with the murder of a 19-year-old Aboriginal man in his home in the very remote Northern Territory community of Yandamu. I attended the Supreme Court to meet the family of the young deceased man. On the day I attended, Mr McAvoy said, the summing up had just been completed and the family were hopeful but understood the difficulties. That trial was conducted before a jury that did not include a single Aboriginal person. That fact attracted some media attention when the jury was sworn in and a lot more attention when a not guilty verdict was returned. For my own part, he said, there can be no justification that permits a First Nations person in the Northern Territory to be trialled before an all-white jury. First Nations people make up approximately one-third of the Northern Territory population. He said that the analysis that occurred during and after the verdict in Rolfe turned to the Juries Act of Northern Territory and the regulation, which provides that jurors may only be drawn from the relevant jury district and limited jury districts to the suburbs of Darwin and Alice Springs, both areas in which Aboriginal people are greatly outnumbered by non-Aboriginal people. He said, there are many knots in the Australian justice system which must be untangled and ensuring representation of Aboriginal people on the juries and benches as arbiters of fact is a large knot. First Nations disenfranchisement from ju the jury system is not new, nor is it disconnected from Australia's colonial DNA, but its continuing presence does nothing to give First Nations people any confidence that the system is one that is inclusive, fair or just. He said that the authors of the report had advanced the discussion and laid bare in clear form the issues and options for further understanding which might lead to reform and it was now up to others, perhaps us, to take action. In summary, the report said, it this is a summary of what the report said, it considered the legal and systemic barriers to the equal representation of Indigenous Australians on contemporary juries. It contextualises the experience of Indigenous Australians within the colonial narrative and profound history of political disenfranchisement. It highlights that the racial divide of the jury has been systematically entrenched in statute, case law, social and economic divides since the establishment of the jury system in Australia. The reliance on random jury selection for achieving representative juries disadvantages Indigenous Australians, it says, who are underrepresented on the electoral roll due to their o and due to their overrepresentation in the criminal justice system, disproportionately disqualifying them or limiting their eligibility for service. Despite this, there is no publicly available current statistics on Indigenous jurors. Instead, the findings of the report had to be based on substantive anecdotal observations and limited point-in-time statistics. The report adopts six guiding principles to jury selections, selection, and I think this applies to the representativeness of all juries. Uh, when I speak about Indigenous Australians not being properly represented, we can also think of many other marginalised uh, or minority groups in our society. People with disabilities, people from culturally and linguistically different backgrounds. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the uh, trial involving an Asian defendant where there's no Asian name in the jury panel. So let me conclude by saying Oh, sorry, the six guiding principles, I should say what they are. Juries should be and be perceived to be independent, impartial and competent lay tribunal. Juries should be randomly selected and broadly representative. Wide participation in jury service is to be encouraged. Adverse consequences of jury service should be avoided. 
relevant laws should be simple and accessible and lastly, local conditions should inform reform. So let me now conclude by saying, in relation to women, we now have a more diverse judiciary at all levels in Queensland and gender equality on juries. But if juries are meant to be members of the community who are peers of the defendant, then it is critical that First Nations people are also fairly represented on juries. The legitimacy of our criminal justice system may be said to depend on it. To quote Justice Crowley from his swearing-in speech when he became a judge of the Supreme Court of Queensland, always was, always will be, about justice. Thank you. Thank you, Rosalind, for an absolutely fascinating and thoroughly uh, well-researched uh, historical and thought-provoking analysis of juries and their place in our democracy. Can I ask you all to thank um, the Honourable Rosalind Atkinson AO for her uh, speech tonight. And we have a gift. Thank you. <laughs> That's thank from you. us. Thank you very much. Um, now, before uh, we go and enjoy refreshments in the portrait gallery, I just would like to add one more thanks, and that is to Megan Reeve. Uh, Megan, since 2015, has been instrumental in developing the Supreme Court Library's Queensland's Events Program, which delivers and supports events like tonight's um, and uh, other events, including the current Legal Issues Seminars, Supreme Court Orations, e Exhibition Launches, the Brisbane Open House, uh, the Associates Orientations and Emission Ceremonies, and, and many, many library functions. She's accomplished so much and she's made a significant contribution during her time at the Supreme Court Library of Queensland. And this is an opportunity that we would like to take to thank her because this is her last event with us. She's an accepted appointment as the Training and Events Manager at the Department of the Senate Canberra. So we thank this opportunity to thank Megan and to wish her well in the future. And come up, up because I've got a gift for you too. Thank you.